Today is Monday, and this is Inside the Mixing Vault. Here are your hosts, producer, mixer, engineer, Nick Battistone, and producer, mixer, and engineer, Louis Millard. Hey, what's happening, everyone? Welcome to episode three of Inside the Mixing Vault. I am producer, mix, and engineer, Louis Millard. And I am producer, mixer, and engineer, Nick Battistone. Welcome to episode three for our discussion on DAWs. Uh, Last week, we left you with a little piece of information on how to decide on the right studio setup for you and your own personal needs. Um, That conversation is going to carry over here this week as we discuss DAWs. Uh, We all know the modern studio is centered around your DAW choice. A lot of the, the work that you do, a lot of the the choices that you make are based off of what your DAW is. Um, and that said, I think we're going to start the conversation off today by talking a little bit about our own personal choices and DAWs, why we chose them, what we like about them, and then we're also going to discuss some additional options for other DAWs. So I will turn it over to Lewis right now so he can discuss his personal choice and DAW. Right, my personal favorite is Cubase. Now, I've been using it for years now. Like, I'm talking pure years, man. I think, in fact, when I started using it, it wasn't even Cubase. It was like Nuendo. So it's been like a good, I think it's like 10 years, you know. But I've not got the latest version yet, but I'm definitely going to look to get it because I've seen it and it looks pretty, pretty mad. But the reason I like to use it is it's quite... It looks more complicated than what it is to use, um, but I like it because it is actually simple to use. And I tried to look at Pro Tools like that Nick uses, and man, it just looks so complicated to me after looking looking at Cubase. Now, it, it I haven't always used Cubase. I did use uh, Mixcraft before, and when it comes to switching over to Cubase, it looked. I was in the same situation that I thought, oh, so it looks so complicated and and whatever. But it's definitely, it's really easy to use. Obviously, you've got unlimited uh, tracks you can put in. Uh, it's literally just uh, the case of your tracks are laid out, you can pull the mixer up. Obviously, you can set up for mixing, you can set up for mastering, set up for recording. You can do everything inside Cubase, mixing, uh, mastering, editing. And yeah, so I just, it's my personal favorite because I'm familiar with it. I've used it for for a long time now. Right, and you know, uh, one thing too, that we're on the subject of Cubase, um, I know a lot of, uh, I have a few friends that are film composers that love Cubase. I have a few friends that are producers that love Cubase. And I think one of the big advantages is that Cubase, their their plugins and virtual instruments are VST based. Um, and as we all know, there are extensive, extensive collections of free VST instruments, VST plugins uh, available all over the internet. Not to mention the you know great mass quantity of incredible uh, paid plugins uh, from various manufacturers as well. So I think uh, honestly, I mean VST really kind of is the largest plugin platform, uh, to my knowledge. Um, and yeah, this is this is definitely going to be an interesting podcast as Lewis has now opened up a soundboard uh, and is now going to be dropping random DJ effects throughout all of our podcasts. So not only this, uh, this one, show... I wanted horns in the last one and you wouldn't let me have them, Nick. So I thought if I bring them now on the iPad, you can't really say no if they're already in there. Yeah, well, this show is going to go off the rails really, really fast. <laughs> And there we have it. (laughs) But anyway, um, so the people who are actually listening to this for information (laughs) can, um, you know, that's that's one of the good things I know about about Cubase is the the accessibility to a lot of third party plugins and a lot of free plugins. Um, You know, not only is Cubase a great quality DAW to work with, I know. I've used it personally a lot over the years, uh, especially when I was starting out. Um, it was actually one of the first DAWs that I purchased as well for my own personal use. Um, I think it was Cubase 3 back then was it um, when I bought it. 
I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's when I first got it. Um, just kind of playing around because I had been using Pro Tools already at that point in studios that I was working out of. Um, and I was still kind of experimenting on my own personal uh, rigs at, you know, home and, and for, you know, recording with other artists that I work with and stuff on the side. So, you know, I was really kind of trying everything out to figure out what I liked the most at that point. Um, but that is one thing that I can say for sure. If you are on a limited budget, uh, Cubase is definitely an incredible option. Um, I, I, I think there's, you know, great results can be achieved from that DAW. Uh, I know a lot of people like sequencing in Cubase. Um, I think, uh, again, that's what a lot of my film composer and producer friends love about it. Yes! Uh, it's got a great sounding audio engine. Yes, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and, and the fact, again, that you can experiment and, and play with different plugins uh, that are available for free. Now, I am going to say, uh, as I segue into my DAW of choice, which is, of course, Pro Tools, uh, and more specifically Pro Tools HD, um, but in Pro Tools, though, Pro Tools up until version 10 ran the RTAS plugin format, the real-time audio suite plugins, uh, now under version 10... 11 and well now 12 uh, you know just coming out in the near future um everything is pretty much is exclusively since 11 on the aax uh plug-in platform so i'm not sure if um companies have created uh plug-in wrappers for aax i'm not exactly sure how that works um i don't think so um but in previous versions, up to Pro Tools 10, if you are using Artaz uh, plugins, you know, in Pro Tools, you can actually get a a wrapper made by F Expansion, which would take VST plugins from Cubase and basically wrap them in an RTAS format so you can use them inside of Pro Tools. Uh, so that is one way that, you know, if you are a Cubase user looking to, to try Pro Tools out and you have a nice collection of VST plugins, uh, you can pick that uh, plugin wrapper up if you're using a version of Pro Tools 10 or earlier. Um, you can wrap those VST plugins uh, as RTAS and, and use them inside of Pro Tools. So that being said, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, Pro Tools is, of course, my DAW of choice. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that it is because it is the best sounding and, you know, it's because everybody uses it or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm just simply saying it. It's my favorite because I'm used to it. Uh, you know, I came up working and interning in studios that all ran Pro Tools. Uh, you know, at that point in time, um, you know, 12 plus years ago, this was kind of the staple. It was the only DAW that you really saw in every studio. So, you know, I had to I had to get used to using what the studio used. And so that's why I got used to Pro Tools. And then over the years, as I, you know, spent more time in it, I learned all of the ins and outs. You know, I know all my keyboard shortcuts. So I'm able to fly through things in Pro Tools, you know, much faster than I can in other that's DAWs. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> anyway, so that being said, um, there are also other things that I personally love about Pro Tools, and that's the fact that working in Pro Tools from a signal flow perspective really does recreate the environment of working in an analog room. Um, again, you know, I've come up in rooms that were, you know, analog rooms with analog consoles and, you know, even tape machines in some place. But every, you know, my generation, at least, you know, Pro Tools was always kind of a, a fixture. Um, so I'm used to the signal flow. Uh, the signal flow is very reminiscent of, you know, working on an analog console. Um, and, you know, now that I have my own mix room with an analog console and outboard gear, the, the process is very easy. I can easily output my signal uh, through my converters. You know, it's, it's very cut and dry. It's, you know, again, I guess just like anything else, you know, once you get used to it and you learn it, you spend time with it and you master it, things become a lot easier. So... You know, I, I think the thing that we can say, man, is, you know, there is no right or wrong answer, just like anything. And I think I've said this in every podcast now, you know, it's 
it's not the tool, but it's the person using the tool. You know what I mean? If you put a great tool in the wrong hands, you're not going to get great results out of it. So, you know, that's the same thing to be said for DAWs. I've heard great mixes. I mean, you know, me being a Pro Tools guy, I wouldn't personally choose to use anything else just because I feel like I can get better results out of this knowing it so well. And I think Lewis has the same feelings about working with Cubase, right? I mean... <laughs> yeah. So is that what you're going to do? You're just going to hit effects the entire no, time no. instead of actually talking? <laughs> if I, obviously, if there's a choice in it, then I wouldn't choose to use choose any, um, choose to use anything else. But if right. there's if I'm gone if I'm going somewhere where they don't necessarily have what I use, obviously we learn how to use other things. So as if it comes to it and we have to use something we're not 100 percent familiar with, we can still get around it, so to speak. But I wouldn't choose to personally. Uh, Nick's trying to get me to go over to Pro Tools, man. I'm, I am. I'm, I'm thinking I'm about it. Convert, I'm yeah. thinking about it. But obviously, I think all the other DAWs, they're all edging towards the Pro Tool sort of look and feel sort of thing. Right. So I think they're slowly easing people into like the Pro Tools style and the Pro Tools workflow and stuff. So I think eventually everyone's going to be at Pro Tools because eventually they're going to be like... I mean, if there's just like one or one new thing on the newest version of your your particular DAW, obviously it's easy to get to know to use one one new new one new feature. Whereas, obviously, when you go switching from say Cubase to Pro Tools, there's so many different things. It's so hard. But if they're easing you into it slowly, one by one, by the time you get to three or four versions down the line, you might be ready to use a different one. But mm -hmm. we're not necessarily saying, oh, you only need to use these two because obviously there is. There is a lot more, a lot more uh, DAWs out there. I can't really put a, a number on how many different ones there is because obviously there's so many different ones and some so many that some people don't really know about. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's one thing we are going to talk about a little bit here uh, in just a few moments is the other DAW options that are out there. Um, you know, one of the big ones that we haven't talked about yet, which, again, we will hear momentarily, is Logic. Um, yeah. I know, you know, Logic is another huge option. And, and from my personal perspective, you know, I think Logic and Pro Tools are two of the, uh, the biggest contenders in the DAW space for mainstream studios. Videos, but I really think if you count the users, I think Cubase has just as many users as either of those DAWs. But I think you know, in the and again on the on the you know super professional mainstream side of things, I think Logic and Pro Tools are kind of dominating. But again, by sheer count of users, because of the affordability and the features offered by Cubase, um, you know, I think there's probably just as many, if not more, users in that area as well. Um, which, you know, again, there's there's no right or wrong choice when it comes to deciding on a DAW. Much like we discussed last week, you know, it's all about your needs and your preference. Um, I know a lot of uh, EDM producers, um, you know, musicians who uh, do a lot of electronic music, um, hip hop producers and artists uh, who make a lot of their beats uh, and record themselves as well, love Logic because, um, you you know, first off, the, the sequencing in Logic is great, you know, absolutely. Uh, sequencing in Logic is very easy. Um, you know, it comes with a lot of really great uh, virtual instruments that sound incredible. Um, you know, recording in Logic is, is great. It's a great sounding uh, audio engine as well, but, you know, it's, it's all preference, and finding something that fits your needs is exactly what you have to consider. And not only that, but your budget as well. Um, you know, if you're just going to be doing music for yourself, you're not really planning on collaborating with other studios or sending sessions out to be mixed. You're just doing something for your own personal enjoyment of recording your music and sharing the final product with others. Then, you know, you don't really have to look at some of those more expensive DAWs like Logic or Pro Tools um, if if it's not something that you, you can afford to do. Um, you know, Cubase, I think, would be a great choice, uh, you know, for somebody who's just looking to, to start out and get an idea of how a professional DAW functions. Yeah, yeah, man, it is. Um, but, like, going back to what we said last week on the interface and stuff like that, there's a version of Cubase that they do quite a lot of in interfaces come with 
Uh, it's called LE. I think they're on like LE seven or something now. But mm-hmm. obviously, that's just a stripped down version of the the bigger product. Obviously, so see if you like it and stuff like that. Because you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't just go for the straight for the mainstream stuff if you know what i mean like i'm sure nick will probably want to talk about uh because uh, I, I can't talk about it really because i haven't used it but reaper the free the free uh the free daw right yeah uh and that's actually that was exactly where i was going to uh to go with this next as we moved into other daws is um you know there there are options out there for free um now granted i've never been a what you would call Reaper user. Um, there's been a few studios that I've I've been in that have used it as their DAW, and I know at that point in time it was freeware. So I don't know if the current version of Reaper is still freeware or not. Um, I think the last time I heard somebody said there was two options. You had a <laughs> you had a basic version, and then you had another version, I think, that you could upgrade to. But again, don't quote me on that because it's not my DAW of choice, so I don't know a whole lot about it. But what I do know is that um, it's it's a great DAW to use if you're interested in you know the, kind of the Pro Tools workflow uh, because I know a lot of the way that Reaper functions and is set up is very reminiscent of Pro Tools. So you know it's a great way to get a DAW for free and you know make great sounding recordings, get used to working in a DAW, you know learn how to edit, learn how to mix, learn how to work with plugins and and route signal inside a DAW and and you know really again master your craft before you step up to something else. And that's the one thing I wanted to say about Pro Tools and especially now with Pro Tools 12. One of the main reasons even early on when I was just starting out, um, you know, like I said, I was working in studios that was that were running Pro Tools, and I was experimenting with other DAWs just to kind of see what I liked for my own personal music production and recording and such. But I kept wanting to go back to Pro Tools, not only because I was comfortable with it from working uh, in the studios that had it, but also for the fact that collaboration and sharing files between multiple musicians and studios at that point, and even more so now was so much easier because, you know, Pro Tools being kind of a studio standard, uh, a lot of the studios you go into will have it. So it's easy to to work in one studio today on a session and record uh, an artist and Pro Tools in this studio and then go to a completely different studio tomorrow to mix it, open up the files right off my hard drive and get right to work after just, you know, making a few adjustments to my IO and, and you know, things of that nature. So, you know, being able to do that is, is a great feature uh, that, you know, again, Pro Tools has because of its followers and its, you know, prominence in the industry, I guess. And now with Pro Tools 12, you have the the new online community and, mar- and, you know, all of that stuff where you can collaborate and share files and stuff with people. So it's only getting more accessible and more collaborative. Yeah, just as you were just speaking about Reaper before and you weren't sure on whether you had to pay for it or not, I've just got it up on, on the iPad now. Yeah. Um, Basically, there's two different licenses for it. There's a uh-huh. full commercial license, which is only two hundred and twenty-five dollars, or there's a discounted license, which is sixty dollars. But in clip, basically, that discounted license is for people that their their terms on here is if your revenue exceeds twenty thousand dollars a year, you'll need to pay for the full license. Whereas if you're just a personal user, you're not you're not making mm. like multi-platinum records and stuff on it you get the 60 dollar the 60 dollar le- lease okay so they don't offer the freeware version anymore uh it doesn't look i think this that's for their latest version i think you can get previous versions for for free but okay. this is their up-to-date one that was released last year Okay, cool, cool. I appreciate it. Yeah, because that's, I know that was one of the things that um, at, you know, a a few years, probably five, six years ago now, uh, a good friend of mine uh, who I engineered with off and on uh, over the years, um, you know, he had been a Pro Tools user in all the studios that we had worked in and, you know, the studios that he had studied in. But when it came to setting up his own personal studio at home, he didn't have the budget to, to go out and buy a Pro Tools HD rig. So he decided that he would spend you know his money wisely on good mics and an interface and he 
became a Reaper user for a long period of time. And that's right when it like first came out, I think, um, is when he started getting into it. And I know, like I said, then it was free. And the one feature that he loved about it was the workflow seemed very, again, reminiscent of Pro Tools. So he was able to, to you know, work with it just the same as he was uh, with Pro Tools. Um, so, again, that's, you know, a great thing. Uh, to have, uh, you know, affordable DAW options like that. And that's the whole point of the discussion is making the decision based off of what you need is is budget your your deciding factor are features your deciding factor uh, is there a, an additional concern um, whether it's what type of plugins they support um, whether it's something that you know is has a great sequencer built into it um, but you know nowadays as as Lewis had just said a few mo moments ago you know all of the DAWs kind of you know at first had different pros and cons about them, but now they're all kind of starting to even out to a point where they have a lot of the same features. They can all pretty much do the same things nowadays um, and with great quality too. So Yeah, man. Like <clears throat> It seems like everybody's aiming towards a, the same the same thing now because obviously because it's because they've because <clears throat> sorry if they've all got their own individual businesses uh they obviously all need to make money so if pro tools are taking cleaning up on the whole thing other people need to look at what they're doing over there and see if they is there any way that they can claw some customers back by making it the same or having similar aspects that pro tools has but mm -hmm. obviously pro tools is is um industry standard but I don't know if that's like, is that official, Nick, or is that just something someone said? Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's again, uh, it, it uh, <sighs> <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to say this the right way so I don't like get pegged by somebody uh, and, and get some, you know, Pro Tools haters jumping <laughs> on my back. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, it really is just because it was the first to be that widespread, you know what I mean? Um, I, that's really kind of why, because, you know, Pro Tools has been around for, God, like uh, literally like almost 20 years in one form or the other, you know what I mean? So before there were all these DAWs out there at great prices, Pro Tools was one of the first to be, you know, on the market for Pro Studios. And at that point in time, it really only was for Pro Studios. So... You know, you, you had to have, I think, I forget how much it cost at the beginning. I heard some other engineers talking about it, you know, in the very early years of Pro Tools, but it was expensive. It was not cheap. And, you know, so studios were, you know, big studios were really the only ones that can afford it. And as computer-based recording and people became so much more um, widely accepted. People loved the the digital editing capabilities of it so much, and you know, not having to worry about t the expense and time and hassle of tape. And you know, you you again had the the editing capabilities that you didn't have with uh, like ADAT machines and things of that nature. Um, you know, it really started to grow in popularity, and that being kind of the only one available, all the studios bought it. So that's kind of how it became an industry standard it was the first to get there you know what i mean so it's so widespread now that it it, it kind of still maintains that reputation but as other things have come up over the years they're starting to creep into that space like logic has become such a huge contender over the past few years and that was uh in 2004, the very first studio that uh, a friend of mine and I had done, just a small little studio to record regional bands and stuff, um, the, we, the first interface we bought was a Roland SI24, which was an eight uh, XLR input interface, and it was a control surface as well, which was awesome at that point in time. And it came with Logic, but at that point, it was uh, Logic was owned by eMagic, and you can run it on Windows or on Mac. And, and so that's what we used, uh, just because, again, it fit or excuse me, it fit our needs and met our expectations of what we needed to get out of it. Um, and then now, you know, Logic has continued to grow now that it's an Apple product and it's so widespread that, you know, I think there's just, like I said earlier, as many as many users in Logic probably as there are in Pro Tools. Yeah, man. Actually, I've got some information on, on Pro Tools now. Like, yeah. it was originally, it wasn't originally called Pro Tools. 
Yeah, it was uh, sound designer first. That was sound in, designer. That was yeah. in 1984. Uh huh. And then it was called Sound Tools in 89. Sound Tools was the first name. Yeah. And then uh, the or first the DAW, version of Pro Tools launched in 1991, offering four uh-huh. uh, four tracks, and it was six thousand dollars. Yeah, man. See, that's what I'm saying. So it's been over. Yeah, I, I keep forgetting that we're in 2015 already. So yeah, it's been God almost. 30 years you know what i'm saying obviously as as the software as the actual hardware and stuff has got better it's obviously increased it only started it started off on a 16 bit well not 8 bit 8 bit yeah man and then then went to 16 and now it's 24 but obviously you can understand back then it only allowed four tracks and now what is it now is it unlimited now nick or uh I mean, yeah, for the most part, um, I mean, God, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever met the, the track limitations of Pro Tools HD. Um, you know, I mean, I think my, my DSP would crash before I ran out of tracks. Yeah. And I think, was it the first like affordable version of Pro Tools was the DG Design one? Yeah. In, I think that was 1993 and it was like $400 or something. Was that on the uh, what was the interface that was that was out with that at the time? Um, I don't know. I think it was just a digi design one, wasn't it? Uh, that's what I'm trying to think. It was. Oh no, it's a multi track recorder called Deck. Okay, yeah. I I think I've seen some of those. I have actually uh, in my storage unit. I have one of the. Uh, old old generations of the pro tools hd systems which was the the mix the pro tools mix systems um it's uh what what is the i'm trying to remember the name of the uh the the interface but you know what i mean it was the the mix core system or something like that i forget um but uh yeah i mean that was around from i think the late 90s maybe into the early 2000s right yeah before it moved into pro tools hd because that's like again that's right around the time that i started into it was you know the early 2000s so i know you know what was just kind of phasing out and then you know with pro tools hd coming in um i remember that much but but yeah i mean you know it's i think that's kind of how it's got you know garnished a reputation of becoming an industry standard because you know it's just been around for so damn long you know what i mean it 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 just got that reputation and you know it's not because it's uh you know not a great product either because it certainly is um you know it, it's it's one of the first to get there Nick's and a big fan. you know the, the yeah i am man i i absolutely am he's a uh, fan Pro Tools, Hey, Pro Tools and I, man, we we do a, we spend a lot of time together. <laughs> I think I spend more time with Pro Tools than I do with my fiance. So um, he you takes know, um, I, I might he takes say something box of um, you know like the box that you get the DAW, and he takes that on like dates and stuff. He takes it to the cinema and things like that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, man! Are you kidding? And and all joking aside, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seriously considered getting the Pro Tools logo tattooed on me. I, it's it's been a it's been a serious decision. That's mad though. Like that's serious though. Obviously, that is a serious issue, Nick. That you've got there. Yeah, mate. I, I, I think I you might need to speak need... to Avid and see if they've got any some sort of counselling or something they can help you with. Yeah, that's I mean, what I was getting a logo say, tattooed on you is, is a big deal, man. Yeah, man, I, I might, I might start, uh, you know, selling all my possessions just to feed my protein addiction. <laughs> <laughs> just keep buying stuff. He's he's got an addiction to pro tools that needs feeding, man. So, mm-hmm. but I think Nick, don't you have like three or four like different full versions of pro tools? Uh, I mean, over the years, yeah, because I, you know, I started with the the version. What was it when I first got it? Six? Yeah, I think it was on six back then. Um, and then, uh, you know, I bought, um, when the Mbox 2s came out, I bought one of those, which uh, was, I think, Pro Tool 7 at that point. Um, and then, uh, you know, now I'm on a Pro Tools HD system. And then, like I said, I bought one of those uh, original, uh, you know, Pro Tools TDM mix 
systems uh, used years ago just to have it. I just wanted to play with it. Uh, it was before I had a uh, an HD rig. Um, it was when Pro Tools LE was out um, with the M boxes and stuff. Um, because that it, that that was the other thing too. At that point in time, um, you know, on laptops, the only way you could work with Pro Tools on a laptop was with, um, you know, an M box and Pro Tools LE. Because for the longest time, you know, up until really it was version nine of Pro Tools. So relatively recently, within the past few years, um, you had to own digi design and avid's hardware to use pro tools and that was one of the big uh you know it was almost like uh, an exclusionary factor it was like you you, you can't join the club unless you buy the yeah, interface like an elite club man yeah and and granted they're great interfaces i still have them i have an m box laying around here i have a 002 laying around here and if i have to go somewhere and do some recording on my laptop um you know i keep a, a 002 in a travel rack uh just because i've had it for years and i know how it sounds and you know whatever and i've got other stuff nowadays that i use too but um you know they were still great pieces uh but you had to have the hardware to use the software and then now uh that you know there's great interfaces by a lot of manufacturers out there uh, you know pro tools has lifted that restriction and and you can now you know use any interface for the most part with pro tools and you know i think that's really just only gone to to you know help make pro tools and establish it as an incredible DAW by allowing you to you know be able to use great pieces by other companies. I think when uh, Pro Tools were also like the first company to have stripped down versions of their their software because obviously it's only like offering the LE. Yeah, the LE and obviously the M Powered. Right. Um, Because obviously there's other companies that was either you have the full version or you don't. Whereas Avid always like to. I don't know how to put it. Give you a little bit, so you want more. If you know, obviously that's that's what's happened right. with Nick. He started off in a little way, and now he's just gone off. But yeah, like they, they, I think they, they're good because they won't. They know that. I think they know that their product's expensive, like their their mainstream product, so to speak. And they know that it's a big for quite a lot of people. It's a big big deal to spend that sort of money on something without Mm -hmm. actually being able to see what it's about first if you know what i mean yeah absolutely and and you know i think even and and i know they're doing it now with uh the the new what is it pro tools first is that what it is the free version that they're offering um as memory serves me correctly i want to say uh you know about 10 years or so ago pro tools offered a, a free version then too called pro tools free i thought um, now I, I, I'm, again, it's been so long. Don't quote me on that a hundred percent, but, um, if Lewis is still doing research on his end, he might be able to confirm that. But yeah, I, I think that's a, a great thing that Pro Tools and, you know, DigiDesign Avid have done is, you know, they know that, you know, they're, they're real creme de la creme top of the line product being the you know pro tools hd systems and studios and now the hdx systems of course um are you know expensive and out of the reach of most home users but they want to be able to offer the same quality and the same you know product and workflow in a more affordable package by offering um you know a, a different version of the software at a better price uh offering you know multiple interfaces uh from different price points i mean i remember when the mbox 2 generation was out you know you can get an mbox 2 mini all the way up to the 003 rack or control surface um so you know they've always made a lot of options to get into their get into their hardware and into their software um and I think that's a great thing, too, because if you're planning on having a career in audio, I think it's advantageous to learn Pro Tools, um, you know, whether you choose it as your personal DAW or not, as we kind of circle back to the to the initial topic that we started discussing here. Um, you know, whether you choose to use Pro Tools as your, your personal DAW or not, um, I do 
suggest if you have the time and ability to learn it in one form or another, whether that is, you know, spending time with a friend who has Pro Tools and having them show you some things, uh, you know, watching some videos on it, um, getting a chance to work with it when you have access to it, or if you can, you know, get the new Pro Tools first and play with it in your spare time. You know, just for the sake of, you know, it, it, having a career in audio, it, it's going to be something you encounter. You know what I mean? I don't think there's anybody in the the industry that says, you know, um, you know, I want to have a career working in audio as a producer or as an engineer, but um, I don't ever expect to ever be around Pro Tools ever. You know what I mean? You, you just can't say that. It's going to come up. It will, you know what I mean? It's going to be there. You're going to be in the studio that only runs Pro Tools, and you're going to at least want to know what you're doing. I will be so, a producer on one, one condition. Yeah, I do not have to look, even look, let alone use Pro Tools. Yeah, well, hey, you know what? But no, I do have – no, that wasn't me saying that. That's, that's just Yeah, me. I know, I know. But obviously, yeah, yeah I've got that – there's not any information on the original free version, but it was called Pro Tools Free. But there's no information okay. on it because obviously it was so long ago. But they're bringing Pro yeah. Tools First out now. So if you go onto their website, you can sign up for that. So I would say there's no excuse now for people right. to be running pirate versions of Pro Tools. Yeah, there's no excuse absolutely. anyway because there's free software out there, as we spoke about Reaper and stuff. But don't just go and right. torrent stuff because you think it's going to be the best because if you like we go back to it time and time again you need to know how to use your tools and if you don't exactly. know how to use your tools pro tools then you're not going to get better results on it as you would <laughs> right. something that's completely right. free like audacity is free if you want to just get into it and see if it's for you go and grab audacity that's free or pro tools first that's going to be free but just don't torrent mm-hmm. it and think that you're going to be the next big thing because it's, it's not good look man yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think we we discussed that in the very first podcast, uh, you know, about about people who you know expect to just go and download and pirate software and and plugins and everything else, and that you know they're going to be able to all of a sudden you know make these great records without having to invest any time, money, or you know, interest in learning the craft. It just doesn't work that way. So I, I would suggest that you, if you're interested in getting into Pro Tools and you want to you want to actually take learning audio seriously and you don't have the budget to go out and buy, you know, uh, an Mbox or an interface and the Pro Tools software right away, then you know what? Download, when when it becomes available, the, the new free version of Pro Tools First Spend some time learning it. Watch all the videos you can. Uh, you know, learn everything you can, not just about the DAW, but about audio in general. Because you know, th- I, this is kind of something that we haven't really talked about before, as we've discussed. You know, learning audio and mastering your craft. But you know, learning and understanding audio and the tools associated with audio is is kind of a um, a must-have prerequisite for working with any DAW plug-in, hardware, piece of equipment, whatever. Because if you don't know what an equalizer is and how they work, you don't know what a compressor is and how to adjust attack and release time and set ratio and threshold, then it doesn't matter what DAW you're using, how great the plug-in, et cetera. If you don't know just the fundamentals of audio tools and understand what they do and how to to use them in your favor, then you're not going to get a good result no matter what you're doing. And I know, again, just as Lewis said, that all goes back to, you know, mastering your craft and, and becoming uh, knowledgeable in what you're doing. So, um, you know, that's that's really the the thing to consider with with anything that you're doing when starting out is making sure that you you gain the knowledge first before you start dropping, uh, you know, tons and tons of money on things, expecting them to, to give you something that they're just not going to give you. Um, so, uh, that being said, um, I do want to say one thing too, uh, about, uh, DAWs when we, we mentioned logic, um, for those of you who are thinking about it, just, uh, a heads up, you know, logic is one of those DAWs that is exclusive to Mac. Um, so if you're not a Mac OS X user, uh, you know, I would look at other options such as Cubase, such as Personas has studio one. 
um, which I know Lewis has kind of become a fan of as well. Yeah, man. Um, I, I, I honestly haven't had a chance to work in it, um, so I can't really speak about it. Um, but uh, is there is there anything that you you want to say about it? Because it's it's certainly an option for for people looking for alternatives to you know maybe a PC user who you know wanted to go Logic but they can't because they're a PC user um, and they're looking at other options aside from Cubase. Uh, you know, is there there's some reasons why they should look towards Studio One? What do you like about it? Um, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, Studio One is good. Like, there's several different. Um, they've got several different versions out like they've got studio mm-hmm. one producer which obviously is what it is for producers there's a studio one artist which is for like single artists but there's the one that i'm using is the pro version pro version 2 uh-huh. which it, it literally does everything um everything that you need inside so going from making beats uh producing full full records it it does it all in all in the one thing but it's just like it's easy to learn. It's very easy to learn um, because it went back to the same thing that I thought when I first looked at it. I thought, no way am I going to be able to use this, man, because it looks so complicated. But as well, on the other side of it, P- Personas, their like, customer service and support is amazing, man. Like, they will. Yeah, any, absolutely. Any problem. I mean, even on Twitter, if you go onto Twitter, if you've got a problem, if you tweet him, Ryan, about Personas, he will tweet you back <laughs> and he will it will help you out and also on their Twitter they're always constantly posting how to do this in Studio One, how to do that in Studio One. And I mean, although I'm not really gonna go too much into promoting other people, but if you check out Joe Gilder Home Studio Corner, he will he's personas uh a personas artist if you like. He's that's he works exclusively with Studio One, so he knows he knows what he's on about with it, but Obviously, I'll have some tutorials coming soon in in Studio One, but primarily I'm Cubase for now. Right. Yeah, man. I mean, that's that's just really the point. You know, there's there's options out there, and uh, you know, you you shouldn't. Again, as we've said a million times, you know, try and and focus on one thing if it's out of your reach. You know what I mean? If if Pro Tools and getting a Pro Tool system is out of your reach right now, um, you know, or you know, any other, if you wanted Logic and you can't afford to buy a Mac and buy Logic, you know, there's other things that can get your feet wet. And just getting the skills and the knowledge uh, and the foundational knowledge is, is really going to be the most important thing. Um, because as Lewis said in the very beginning of this podcast, you know, pretty much all of the DAWs nowadays are all kind of on par with each other. They all offer a lot of the same features and functionality. Um, you know, the workflow is very similar. The layouts are even similar a lot now um so you can really you know what i mean you can really build your skill in an affordable daw and then move up as you develop if you feel like you need pro tools because you're collaborating with other musicians and studios who use pro tools once you get the skill and you get to that point you can do that or if that collaboration is fundamental to your learning because the person who is teaching you is a pro tools user and that's all that they can teach you well then you know what you might have to look at pro tools first um you know, and, and then start there and then work your way up to, to some of the more, uh, you know, uh, all-inclusive features, uh, like the, uh, you know, more uh, expensive versions of Pro Tools, I should say. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that kind of covers our discussion on uh, DAWs for this week. I have one more thing, one thing here. This yeah. is This is um, a list of, this was the top, the top nine DAWs from... 2014 it's from e home recording studio uh which is obviously okay. like a forum so basically it's you you, sure. you sort of guys out there that have voted for these and obviously so i'm not making these up this has come straight from the website so number one awesome so let's let's say the top one is persona studio one number two cakewalk sonar don't know why number three hmm. fl studio number four Propeller Head Reason. Mm. Number five is Ableton Live. Number six, do you know what? I haven't actually heard of this one before. M O T U Digital Performer. Oh, uh, yeah. That's uh, Motu, Mark of the Unicorn, That's Digital not, Performer. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, number seven is uh, Cubase. 
Number eight is uh, Logic. And I'm sorry, Nick. Number nine is Pro Tools. Now, what is this based off of? Is this, this based is off of from, sales? No, this is votes. Oh, this, so this is just votes from that particular forum. This is from three different forums, but obviously, could again, they're home studio users. So, right as as right. we spoke okay. about before, Pro Tools is quite expensive. So, for coming from right. home studio users, which obviously the sort of people that we're uh, aiming at with these podcasts and stuff that's what they're saying but obviously pro tools is quite far down there but like i say sure you're not sure on how many people out there who voted for that actually have used it so right and you know that's actually one thing too i do want to do say is uh, uh, a big shout out to propeller head with reason um i've been a reason user also for just as um, Actually, yeah, about the same amount of time as I've been a Pro Tools user. And, um, you know, up until recently, uh, you know, Reason was just a sequencing program. It was just all about music production and sequencing. Um, and then within the past few years, they've added, you know, a- actual audio recording capabilities and, and transformed Reason into a fully functioning DAW with incredible features. Um, you know, I, I've been very fortunate uh, enough that. Uh, you know, working with Reason and, and the folks at Propeller Heads back and forth over the years that I've got to try and, and work on the new version of Reason a little bit um, with, you know, experimenting with some of their DAW functionality. And I love it because still to this day, like like I said before, you know, I do, you know, the majority of my work is, is as a mix engineer, but I also write you know, a lot of music, uh, both for myself and for other artists that I work with. And I produce a lot of beats and things of that nature. And for all of that, all of that is done in reason. Um, and yeah, I use it with pro tools in rewire mode. Um, so, you know, I'll sequence in pro tool, or I'm sorry, sequence in, in reason and then rewire into pro tools and then do audio there and then some additional sequencing there. Um, but you know, that's the great thing about reason as well is that it does work hand in hand with pro tools in rewire mode. And now, you know, you can do a lot of the things that you had to use Pro Tools with in rewire mode in the past. You can do all of that inside of Reason now with their, you know, complete DAW functionality. So definitely check out Reason, another one of those incredible things. And if you're a producer and somebody who makes beats, uh, you know, whether you're hip hop, R&B, electronic, pop, whatever, um, you know, EDM, doesn't matter. Reason is in my personal opinion, the sickest sequencing program on the market, and their virtual instruments are just incredible. I mean, everything I've done for the past, you know, eight, nine, ten years, uh, as far as sequencing goes, has been touched with reason one way or the other. So, yeah, definitely. I'm glad you mentioned that on that list because that is one I didn't want to uh, to forget about mentioning today. In all honesty, as well, that is like, what is it, Reason 8, the latest version, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, that yeah. is, I don't want to really say only, but it is only $400. Now, that's that's cheap for, for what it is. Yeah, and for especially the amount of sound, you know, sounds you get in it, the sample libraries you get, the virtual instruments, it's nuts. Exactly, and I've got Pro Tools 11, which is at $699. Mm-hmm. I have Studio One uh, version 2, which that's cheap, that's $200. Wow, yeah. Uh Ableton nine. I don't <laughs> don't really rate it, so I don't know why it's at five hundred dollars. Yeah, I you know, there still is a, a loyal following uh of Ableton users out there. Oh yeah, but I wouldn't I don't I think I tried to use it once and they tried they made it so complicated that uh I didn't go back to it. But yeah, then then obviously Cubase is at three hundred and ninety nine. But there's a lot more that we mm-hmm. haven't mentioned DAW wise. There's a new one called Bitwig, so I, have, I can't yeah. really go too far into that because I'm not sh- not too familiar with it. There is yeah, I'm not either. Uh, Adobe Audition. I've mm-hmm. used that before. Uh, again, there there's a lot of people that make things look more complicated than they need to be. So I mean, if you're looking at it and you never touch the DAW in your life, you'll think that's really really complicated. Well, and you know, the one thing to say about that too, um, you know, I look at Pro Tools and I think it it looks like 
just just from first glance, it looks like the easiest DAW to use because it's very it's a clean interface. Um, you know, everything is kind of very cut and dry. There's faders and there's pan knobs. There's you know input and output, and you know it, it looks very clean and things are easy to follow and flow with. But for some of you who have never worked in DAWs before or have just been accustomed to another, you know, workflow or another, you know, GUI with, you know, how this everything looks on the screen, your Pro Tools may look intimidating to you. But don't let that ever scare you away from trying something. Um, you know, the Mixing Vault is all about teaching and we're all about sharing information. And there's a ton of stuff all over the web for free that can easily teach you, um, you know, how to navigate around Pro Tools in 10 minutes. You know what I mean? I don't think there's a tutorial or, uh, or I'm sorry, a DAW out there that you can't find a tutorial for that will teach you how to navigate it inside of 10 minutes. You know what I mean? You could watch the video for 10 minutes and get a basic understanding of how that DAW is laid out. So don't ever let the looks deceive you or scare you away from wanting to use something if that's something you want to try or something you have access to. Um, you know. Yeah, but that's why it's good with, I think, obviously, Avid have, have looked at that and uh, sort of, um, what's it called now? They've sort of actions, actioned it, saying, like, obviously, there, there's a lot of people that are looking to use our product but are too, too uh, intimidated by how it looks. So I think that they've actioned it by putting out a free version so you can... Right. Because it's free. You can, sit, you can sit there for as long as you want learning it. You can look online at tutorials because I know it exactly. might be... Exactly. They might call it, say, a stripped-down version, but I can guarantee it will be like the same work workaround and workflow that you're going to get on the, the bigger version. Right. Absolutely. I think that's that's a great thing uh, that Avid has done is, is you know, allowing you to, to at least experience the DAW for free, because that's the thing is, you know, when you when you're a home studio user going out to buy your first real DAW purchase, you look at the price of Pro Tools at, you know, six hundred dollars and you say, you know, is this worth buying is, you know, this might be too intimidating. I might spend $600 on this and then never be able to figure it out. And then that's a, you know, that's a lot of money for something that I'm never going to be able to use. Well, that's why I said, you know, don't let it scare you away. Um, you know, you can easily, you know, as long as you have the, the, the drive and motivation to want to learn it, um, there are certainly a lot of resources available to teach you. And then now with Pro Tools First being available for free, you can actually spend as much time as you want. I'm assuming there's no limitation, um, you know, as, as far as features and functionality. I think it's just probably track count yeah, and, 16. You, know, if, you know, limited plugins and such. Um, but, you know, it'll at least let you get used to the Pro Tools workflow. And, and then from there, you can make the decision on, is that the right DAW for you? Um, which I'm, I'm hoping it is because I love, uh, I love seeing more <laughs> Pro Tools users coming out here every day. I, I like to, I, I'm one of those people that, uh, like, I'm like a converter. I like to convert people to Pro Tools. I've done it many times. And you know what? I've never had one person go back after I've made a conversion to Pro Tools on somebody. I've never seen them go back to, to anything else. And that's not bad talking any other DAW. That's just me being a, <laughs> uh, an a hole and, yeah. <laughs> and just, but you know, what I mean? just one thing that we support my own thing. We didn't really mention. But um, that we spoke about in, in fact, we this is what made us decide that we're going to do this as our topic. Don't you remember when we were talking about um, people? It, it, you can make hits in any DAW. It's not just the Pro Tools is industry Absolutely. standard. So you know that's going to uh, make my sound completely, completely different. I mean, I speak when I was speaking to Nick and I told him this. I told him I saw a a documentary on YouTube of Phil Collins at, at his own studio. Uh, working with Cubase 5, I think mm -hmm. it was at the time, uh, he was recording, mixing, mastering his own tracks and they're, they're tracks that he put on his album. So, I mean, you can right. imagine how, how many albums he sells. You can, it's not just like Pro Tools is industry standard, so you need to use that to get any sort of professional quality. Of course, uh, of course. You can get them with, with any, any DAW, but that's going back to the know how to use your tools thing. But I just wanted to mention that you can make hits in anything. So anybody that tells you, oh, no, you can't, uh, Cubase, you can't, uh, Reaper, you can't. No, you definitely can make hits in any any DAW if you know what you're doing with it. 
Exactly. Uh, you know what? Like I said, I, I do all of my, my music production inside of Pro Tools and with the help and assistance of uh, Propeller Heads Reason. But you can go on YouTube right now and see interviews with countless hip-hop, pop, and electronica producers who have had number one hit singles, like Billboard chart-topping singles that were produced exclusively in Fruity Loops. You know what I mean? Yeah, man, I, I know, so, um, FL Studio. Back, back in a few years ago, I know um, Timberlands used to use that for his beats. It's, de- it's definitely oh, yeah? not... Yeah, man. I think... Um, there was talk. I, I don't think that. I think I don't think it's true. But there was talk that Dre was using it for a time, but that was probably just to see what it was like. But yeah, you can definitely make. I mean, it's the same with anything. Like if you listen to our last week's uh, podcast uh, about the studio thing, about how you can get stuff on a budget. I heard that one of Drake's uh, engineers actually mixed one of his songs on on some alarm clock speakers. So that goes back hmm. to if you know what you're doing with your tools, you can you can succeed no matter what you're doing, whether you've got Pro Tools, Cubase, Reaper, any any of the ones we've talked about. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it all comes back to just gaining the knowledge, getting, you know, the education in the and building the skills and of course practice, 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 practice. You have to just keep doing it, keep trying, and you know, you believe me, you're gonna make ten thousand bad mixes before you make an incredible one, probably if you're like most of us. Um at least I know I did. But you'll learn from every one of those bad mixes and they'll get progressively better and better and better and better as long as you keep trying and keep thirsty for the knowledge. Uh, of audio because that's that's really what it's all about if you care about doing this yeah just to add to that i'm not a drake fan by the way he's a, I think he's a side <laughs> man, so i'm not I, oh, I, I was just pointing out the fact that if, if you know your tools and you know what you're doing with them then you're gonna you're gonna be big because obviously me and nick we haven't just our sort of studio and stuff we've got and our software and everything it hasn't just come out of nowhere we've started we started at the bottom just like everybody else Absolutely, like I was man. using um, Mixcraft to start with, and that's like at the time that was like a thirty pound DAW, you know, obviously 30, 30 British pounds. So uh, I've gone from that to Cubase. I've used Pro Tools before, like badly probably, but like what I'm saying is you don't, you've got to start somewhere, and if you have to start with a free version, start with a free version. Obviously a a uh, legal free version. But right. You have to start with free version. Right. Start with, and nobody, nobody will say anything to you because everyone's been in that same situation. Everyone's had to start from where you are now. So, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, just keep doing what you're doing and keep mixing and mixing, and you'll get, you'll be able to get great results in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, a great recording can come out of any of the DAWs that we've discussed here today, um, and you know this. I, I think our whole our whole purpose of this topic today was really to just kind of, you know, mention the stuff that's out there and how, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, there's uh, there's a, more options today than there ever has been. And all of them are capable of achieving the great results if you put in the time, energy, effort, and you've worked to develop your skill. And that's really what we wanted to share with you today. So hopefully um, this has helped kind of, you know, ease your decision making on which direction you'd like to go as far as a DAW goes, uh, if you haven't made that decision already. And if you already are into a DAW, say you're a Cubase user, but you keep saying, I wish I had Pro Tools because it's the industry standard and I'm never going to be a professional unless I'm using Pro Tools. That's not true. It's not. You know what I mean? You can... You can have just as successful of a career as a musician or a producer or engineer or whatever you're aspiring to be using Cubase as you could with Pro Tools. So, you know, it's all about the skills that you possess and your ability and desire to sharpen those skills and become the best that you can possibly be. So uh, I think before we close off this week, um, we are going to do, as usual, our plug-in of the week here. Um, so uh, what uh, what have you been messing with a lot this week, man? This week I've been mixing um, a lot of drums and uh, sample, well, not sample drums, but... Uh, uh-huh. So to this week, my plug-in of the week is the SSL LMC1. 
Uh, ah, a, the listen mic compressor. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's exactly what it says. It's a compressor. Uh, it was modelled from a a producer that was working on a Phil Collins record, actually. Um, at the time on his SSL desk, he had a, a microphone that was um, like a listen mic. So obviously he, when he was... It was in the in the booth when Phil Collins was playing on the drums and stuff. So he's obviously set his talking back to Phil Collins. Phil Collins is playing his drums. He can hear some amazing noise coming from the the microphone in the room. But at the time, mm-hmm. he couldn't uh, he couldn't actually record from that at the time because it was some sort of right. uh, that, it, that wasn't a feature. So that night he had uh, he had uh, his assistant take apart his desk. And mm-hmm. he uh, he had it so it was rooted so he could record through the the microphone that was in the uh, in the drum booth. So the next day now he's obviously gone in there and he's recorded it. It's really heavily compressed. It's a set attack, set release. So there's literally just mm-hmm. less or more. That's that's all it says. Right. And, right. and uh, so w- what it basically does it just really compresses like heavily compresses uh, the drum sounds. Um, I normally use it on snares or kicks or if or overheads actually you can literally just compress pr- compress the hell out of your your drums uh-huh. obviously d- double your drum track and then compress the hell out of the double track or just on your overheads man it sounds mad like as well the good thing about that is this ssl of actually uh, it's actually a free plugin yeah from, it is so there we go that goes back to the plugins you can get some good ones for free and that's one of them that's ssl obviously everyone knows big company like mm-hmm. ssl they brought out a free plugin, so definitely you can try that out. I don't think that's available for Mac though. I'm not sure. I think Nick tried to get it, but couldn't. Uh, but Windows definitely. Yeah, I for- Yeah, I forget the reason why I I can't get that particular plugin. I don't remember if it's because it's not Artaz. I think you had trouble uh, with wrapping it. I think. Yeah, I think it. I think it's because of uh, it might only be available in VST and or something like that. But yeah, I know I personally can't use the plugin. Um, however, I'm very familiar with the the LMC on the SSLs, and um, there is actually two or three. Um, templates that i have created um i have a a a bunch of custom effects templates that i built inside of pro tools and i've actually recreated uh different modified uh lmc kind of uh effects um that i can use uh as parallel sends um or you know however i want to use them uh which is actually really cool to do that's the one thing i was going to say is i like using my uh custom lmc created mod you know my emulated lmc chain in parallel on uh room mics um, yeah yeah that's a really man. cool thing to use it on um you know squash the hell out of them with something else maybe uh and then you know s- send that to a uh the lmc uh in parallel and blend the two together yeah but if you're looking for that 80 snare like the oh yeah what you want to do is set up a gated reverb i'll do a tutorial on it next week or something set up a gated reverb and then put that on an as an insert and when mm. your snare hits, man, it's going to hit hard. Yeah. You know, actually, it's it's funny. Um, I just had to explain to uh, my fiance, uh, what was it, on Sunday, uh, about the 80s snare sound, because we were listening to uh, this 80s channel on Sirius XM Radio, and, like, every song had the, you know, quintessential, you know, corny, cheesy as hell 80s Bill Collins snare made that sound. Though, didn't he, I think? Oh man, I, I'm not. You know, I, I why do I want to say Bob Clear Mountain was a lot of res, has a lot of responsibility with how that sounded too as an engineer or as a mix engineer at least. I think uh, so, but, but you know, yeah, it was definitely a big a big thing back then that they was all doing. But the thing is, I love doing yeah. that now. In fact, back on the f- oh, it definitely has its uses today. Back on the first podcast, the very first one when we all spoke about the, the track that I was mixing for Nick. Uh-huh. I've used it on on the snare on that the the kick and um, the snare and the clap. I've used it on there, mm-hmm. so obviously it can be used today on a modern a modern tune. Oh, absolutely, man! I mean, that's the thing is, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of dated you know effects and such that you know you could still use today in moderation when done tastefully. Um, that's you know definitely one of them. Um, 
so moving on to uh, to my plugin of the week, uh, I've I actually been I don't want to say I just use this a lot this week because I think this plugin is on every single one of my mixes, and that is the SPL Twin Tube. Um, first off, this is a harmonic distortion slash saturation plugin. Um, it is actually modeled off of a real piece of analog gear from SPL's uh, modular series. Um, and basically, it, it adds harmonic distortion and tube saturation. Uh, it allows you to create your own kind of uh, custom harmonic distortion and sound based off of uh, applying the, the harmonics processing to four different frequency ranges, which is uh, the 10K, 6K, uh, 3K, and 2K. Um, you know, as far as parameters go, it has uh, a harmonics knob uh, as well as a saturation knob and then output. And you could turn the saturation or the harmonics on and off, uh, respectively. And you can also, as I said, uh, create, you know, or decide rather which uh, frequency band uh, you want to uh, process as far as harmonics go. But I tell you what, this thing sounds incredible, and that's why I use it so much. You know, I I, I love a lot of the uh, you know kind of harmonic distortion and saturation plugins that are out there and i play with them all the time yeah, for man. different uses but this is one of those plugins man that like like i said i i love it especially on um digital effects um when i'm when i have a digital effects return i love to slap the spl twin tube at as the last insert on one of my digital effects returns or plugin effects returns because it just adds that that analog characteristic to it and it makes it feel like you know that was run through my console or run through some outboard gear, just give it a little bit of color, bite, drive. I mean, you can really play with it and get some crazy stuff out of it. Um, and of course, they, they actually have a, a bunch of presets that come with it um, that kind of, you know, give you some options like 808s, claps, um, you know, guitar solos, uh, you know, so a good way to like, you know, get some starting points and, and play with it and, and see what you can come up with. But I guarantee you, this is one of the most realistic analog sounding uh you know harmonics and just and saturation plugins on the market for sure so uh you know great work to spl for for putting this thing out and it will continue to live on all of my mixes <laughs> i guarantee it yeah unlike last week i actually have used this one um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. like it just gives you so much clarity and warmth man like as well mm -hmm. it's versatile as well i think i've used it on Wow, everything, man. Guitars, vocals, brass, uh, kicks, snares. Yeah. It's just so... You can just use it and throw it on whatever you want. Just give it a try. On what, what, I do that with most plugins. I normally just slap it on anything and see how it goes. But you definitely get a good, good characteristics out of the uh, twin tube. And I don't use it as much as I would like to, but obviously that's just myself limiting myself. <laughs> Well, you know what, man? I tell you what's crazy about this, too, is you should look at just sometimes how little I'm actually processing with this plugin and how much of a difference you notice when I put it into bypass. Less is more. I mean, it's just one of the. Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> you know, sometimes it definitely is. And sometimes more is even more. <laughs> you know more what I mean? More, but. More, more. More is way more. Um, there are definitely times when that's the case, too. But. Um, yeah, man. I mean, like I said, just just a little bit of you know. I think this the saturation goes up to what what's the number? It goes up to twenty, I think, uh, on the dial and the plug-in. And sometimes I just have the thing set at two or three out of twenty um, with the harmonics on like three, and you know I just adjust the the harmonic frequency band. And I tell you what, you switch the the thing into bypass, and you notice it's gone immediately. You know what I mean? It it really adds that much coloration. And I tell you what, if I went through some of my latest mixes and I bypassed all of the instances I have of SPL Twin Tube, those mixes would probably fall apart. <laughs> they would probably fall apart. I mean, it's that much responsible for the character because again, I mix hybrid with analog gear and and plugins. So you know, I make decisions on how I'm processing something based off of you know the the sound that I want to get out of it. And you know, those are things that you know when I want analog color and I don't want to leave the box for it, I reach for the SPL Twin Tube. Yeah, hands down. So with 
as well at the same time we're not saying that that's uh, a plug and it's just going to change everything for you obviously, no, of course. <laughs> obviously there has to be other processes in there but again with it right. I like um, the harmonica bit I like how it, it anything you put that on it brings it I find it brings it right to the front mm-hmm <clears throat> But yeah, I've used that. I'm definitely, in fact, Nick, you reminded me uh, to to bring that one back out again. Yeah, man, definitely play with it a little bit, for sure. Because I, I you know, and the cool thing is too, uh, you know, it's all of SPL's plugins are are decently priced. They're great sounding plugins. Um, they're available for pretty much every platform: VST, RTAS, TDM, AAX, uh, you know, Audio Suite. So you know, it's it's one of those things that you can, and they always have sales too um, on the Plugin Alliance dot com plugin dash alliance dot com is where you can you know pick those up and they always have sales going on and stuff so you can pick it up for a really good price and um you know i guarantee it'll be something you'll enjoy using all right so before we take off here today and close out this episode of inside the mixing vault uh we would just like to to say a, a sincere and overwhelming thank you to everybody for uh for staying tuned and uh you know liking and subscribing to the podcast following us on twitter checking out our website for the emails you guys have been sending us uh you know we really appreciate it we we're, we're incredibly you know proud and happy that you know things have been helping you guys out in your journey and learning audio and you know your your passion and appreciation and support only continues to motivate us so uh you know we want to definitely say thank you for that um you know, because things have been growing incredibly fast here uh, at the Mixing Vault. I mean, just, you know, a few months ago, um, you know, the the Twitter account was practically practically dead um, and, you know, non-existent as we were just kicking things off. And, you know, now on Twitter, I mean, things have blown up. And, I mean, how many followers do we have on Twitter now, Lewis? It's over 9,000! <laughs> it's actually eleven point eight thousand. <laughs> nice. See, and you guys did all of that for us. Eleven point eight thousand followers in just what three months, really? Yeah, man, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we we definitely have to give you guys, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of props and appreciation for that. Uh, that means a lot to us. Damn, um, son, you just <laughs> the wow effect. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling these uh, DJ effects are going to become a regular feature of these podcasts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're going <laughs> to, we're, you know, having uh, mentioned the Twitter, um, you know, we again would like to encourage you guys to follow us on Twitter and hit up our websites and, you know, contact us via email. You guys can find me on Twitter at Nick Battistone. Uh, you can check out my personal website at www nickbattistone.com you can email me personally for booking and mixing requests at nbattistone at gmail.com or for anything audio education or mixing vault related you can email me at nickbattistone at themixingvault.co.uk thank you so much for that tag man all right why don't you share the the mixing vault stuff with them now yeah obviously there's <laughs> my my personal twitter which is uh lewis underscore tmv <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> and there's there's the Mixing Vault's uh, Twitter, which is at the Mixing Vault. Damn son. Damn. Son. <laughs> wow, you can that. you can go to that. You can follow us on there. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Follow Nick on Twitter. My personal email is uh, Lewis Millard at the Mixing Vault dot co dot uk. But if you're not a fan of us, you shall not pass. <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to lose 1,000 subscribers right now. <laughs> no, it will be fine, man. It will be fine because we'll just teach him to... Smoke weed every day. <laughs> but that's okay because, you know, we can still lose 2,000 followers and have how many? Well, ah, you caught me out. <laughs> we, we can still do that, though. And hang on for one second. We will still have... If we lose... 2,000. We will still have... It's over 9,000! <laughs> wow, wait for me to set you up and have you not be ready. I'm, 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 I only did that because I saw you sit back and not, and not be playing with the soundboard again, so I wanted to try and call you or catch you off guard. Do you know what I was doing? Because <laughs> I was sat back, I was... Slacker! Slacker! <laughs> yeah, man. 
With those side man effects over there. My side man effects, but Nick, you will get. K.O. <laughs> <laughs> Ready. You can feel for or er, feel free to fast forward through this portion of the podcast. You can definitely, <laughs> definitely fast forward through this part, but the rest of it is. Yeah, man. <laughs> Anyways, this has been episode three of Inside the Mixing Ball. I am producer, mixer, and engineer, Lewis Millard. And I am producer, mixer, and engineer, Nick Bagstone. We thank you guys for stopping by. Hope you've enjoyed it, and we look forward to seeing you again on next week's episode. Take care, everyone.